All right, we are live for our three o'clock live stream. It's very windy where I'm standing right now, and I will move. Just want to get us a nice, pretty view for the start here today. If you are tuning in right off the bat, um, ooh, I see our first like popping up there. Thank you so much for liking it. We've got a couple of viewers tuning in now. Thank you all so much for joining today. We're going to take a look inside of the surgeon's quarters today and talk about what life may have been like for some of the settlers, the gold miners, and the timber beasts up here in Humboldt when Fort Humboldt was established in the 1850s. We'll talk about what their perspective was kind of like. Awesome, we got a couple people tuning in. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let me know real quick if you can see and hear okay from where you're tuning in. I know it's a little windy up here. I'm going to be moving indoors, but it's such a beautiful day out despite the wind. I just wanted to give you a nice little view here to get started. We have a number of people tuning in, so let's go ahead and get started. Just let me know if for whatever reason you can't hear me. I'm going to start by saying hello. My name is Kyle. I'm a park interpretive specialist for California State Parks. Um, in the North Coast Redwoods District, and today I'm at Fort Humboldt State Historic Park. This is in Eureka. Um, so thank you guys so much for joining me. Eureka is up on the North Coast of California, just south of the Oregon border, uh, one of the bigger towns up here. So we're going to be talking about Fort Humboldt, uh, a little bit of the history here, and the perspective of the people coming in who were settling here, some of the gold miners, and the people looking for timber as well. Um, so we'll be talking about that. I'll, I'll cover a little bit of the history of the fort to get started, but we're mainly going to be talking about that perspective of the people who are living here, um, not the soldiers, not the indigenous community, but people coming up here to settle, um, and the gold miners and timber people, people coming for resource extraction. We'll be talking about those. Really quick, I do want to recognize that so many of you guys are doing your part to shelter in place and stay at home, help flatten the curve of COVID-19. We really appreciate you guys doing that and playing your part. It's really important. Um, we try, try to do these live broadcasts every day to give you a little taste of what you might be missing from being inside. We want to bring a little bit of the outdoors to you, give you a little bit of the parks. Our mission is to provide for the health, the inspiration and education of the public um, from state parks. So hopefully we give you a little bit of the outdoor, um, make you feel a little bit better, uh, hopefully inspire you to come back out to these places and explore some new places. And we'll, uh, we'll sneak a little education there as uh, interpreters do. So again, thank you guys so much for joining us. We're also practicing those guidelines, making sure to stay far away from anybody, um, sanitizing our equipment before and after we use it and all of that great stuff. So without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and walk on up to this house up here. This is a reconstructed surgeon's quarters up on top of this little hill. And I'm on the back side of Fort Humboldt. Um, I know it's a little windy, so I'm gonna actually head inside of that building and finish um, and talk a little bit more from in there. So a really quick, short little history of Fort Humboldt. Um, this fort was established to mitigate conflict between the indigenous communities and the settlers living up here on the North Coast. Right around the time of the gold rush, people started coming up here like crazy to settle um, and for resource extraction. They came up looking for gold, but pretty quickly realized that there was a lot of money to be made in timber. So this really started bringing a lot of people up here um, to this area. And as we know, with most places that people came to settle, there were already people living here. There was a ton, um, large indigenous community, different tribes living up here on the north coast, just showing off the poppies because they're super pretty. Awesome, people originally from Eureka joining in. Spectacular, thank you so much for tuning in. So you had um, indigenous communities living up here already, and as more and more people came in, they were wanting to settle where the indigenous people were already living. And this comes with a history of around 200 years of conflict through the rest of Cal uh, the United States, people pushing through with westward expansion, um, removing indigenous communities from their ancestral land. And with that, I do want to recognize that I am on Weyot ancestral land today. And I am going to be talking a lot about the indigenous communities. I'll be using words like native people, first people, indigenous communities, all to refer to the native groups living in this area. I just want to recognize that there's no perfect term to refer to native people. It's best to refer to a specific tribe or ask an individual what their preference is. All right. So we're here outside of the surgeon's quarters. And the reason that I'm standing outside of this building is because this is the closest thing to a house that we have here. Um, from what this is kind of how people were living at this time so as we look around just think about how this house is different from yours and we'll talk a little bit about kind of the experience and the perspective of the people who were living up here now this house is a reconstructed surgeon's quarters and this um, is similar to a fort building that was built here but people living through the rest of Eureka at that time um, 
wouldn't have had that different of an experience in the living experience. So let's head on inside. We'll talk a little bit more. All right. All right, out of the wind and nice echoey acoustics. Um, we'll, head, we'll head into some of the rooms as well so we can look at some of the details. But real quick, again, um, Fort Humboldt was established 1853, and really people were coming up here because of the gold rush, so what was drawing a lot of people up to this area um, to try and make a fortune off of the gold. There weren't incredibly successful gold mines up here, so a lot of people ended up going into timber instead, and harvesting redwood was incredibly profitable. It was said that of some trees, you could make 20 houses just from one single tree. So the timber industry was absolutely huge up here, and especially in Eureka, there was a number of timber mills. And that's how a lot of the people in this area were employed, either working at the meal, mills or going out to um, cut down trees. I've got a big old ax in the corner right here too, just to further illustrate that point. So during the gold rush, people were really coming up here, um, searching for places to live, land to grab, and this was kind of an area where people hadn't really settled as much. But just as through the rest of the United States, as people came up here, there was already indigenous communities and tribes living in the area. And unlike some other areas, the people who were coming up here had the historical perspective of the United States kind of fighting with the indigenous communities for 200 years at this point. This is in the 1850s that people were really starting to come up here. So there was a lot of prejudice against the indigenous communities from the people who were coming up here. And it can be hard to put ourselves in that perspective and definitely not saying that it's right. But it is, I think, really important whenever you're talking about history to consider what the people were thinking about at that time and how their historical knowledge kind of shapes their experience, their beliefs, and their ideas. So when they got up here, like I said, they were not exactly... Um, kind to the indigenous communities that were already up here. And that's a large reason why Fort Humboldt was founded, is because um, these people who had a prejudice against the indigenous communities would just go and occasionally take the land that they wanted. And the indigenous communities would fight back for their ancestral homeland. And this fighting would go back and forth with neither one kind of levying on who could live there. So that conflict got bad enough that the U.S. military sent up soldiers to establish Fort Humboldt. Um, really quick, I have a quote from the colonel as they were arriving. Um, I read this last week, but I do think it so well encapsulates kind of an idea of what this area looked like at that time. This is from the commanding officer who was on that very first voyage coming up to Fort Humboldt. And right as he came into Humboldt Bay, he spotted this bluff that Fort Humboldt is now built on, which is across from the bay. And I have some pictures here of early Eureka as well. So kind of around the time that they were arriving, this is what Eureka may have looked like. Kind of the Humboldt Bay going right up against some of the houses, places where people were living. Not as developed as it is now. There is one story of somebody coming up here looking to get into the timber industry. And um, the bay was kind of difficult to get into at that time. And he ended up crashing his boat on the shore. And rather than trying to repair it or anything like that, he used the boiler from his boat to start and built a timber mill around it. So his, the actual um, engine of his boat became kind of the heart of this timber mill. I just think that's an incredibly interesting story that he came up here and had so no intention of leaving that he just kind of started. Um, just kind of started, uh, started, started building a mill out of it. I thought that was pretty, pretty incredible. Anyway, sorry, uh, got aside from myself there. I have a quote from one of the generals when he saw this bluff, and this is kind of what, what was going on in the area at that time. I just think that this very well encapsulates kind of a good um, view of what this place was like. I'm going to skip this first little part because he's talking about the bluff. He said, this is about Eureka. He says, there's a little settlement on this bay, Humboldt Bay, Thus, there is quite an American population on this bay with a good steam tug to bring in supplies and a small steamer to commute daily with different places. There are constant trains of pack mules between Union, which is present-day Arcata, and the Trinity and Salmon Rivers, and there's a large amount invested in sawmills at Eureka and Bucksport. 
There's abundant lumber, wood, grazing, fresh beef, and potatoes and barley here. All other supplies come from San Francisco. So here he's talking about these kind of three settlements that were here at this time when they arrived. And this is in 1853, um, a couple of years into the gold rush. But there were basically three large towns. Eureka, which I'm in currently. Um, Bucksport, which is actually the area that I'm in currently, would have been Bucksport. Um, the town kind of got eaten by Eureka at some point, so now Eureka is one big town. But at one point, I would be standing in Bucksport, which would have been the south of Eureka. And then to the north, where Humboldt State University is now, Arcata was at that point called Union. <laughs> That's, uh, I like that. Um, talking about the timber guy, typical Humboldt story, you get stuck there. You get stuck here and just end up staying. That is a lot of people's story with how they moved to Humboldt. So they came up here for, for work or for school. They love the area so much they just end up staying. So that's Colonel Mansfield's kind of these three settlements at that. This was the three kind of large cities that they had. But besides that, um, there wasn't a lot up here on the North Coast for quite a long time. And even after Fort Humboldt got established, um, it was a relatively isolated community. It would take a long time for just about anything to get up here. Mail, paychecks. And Fort Humboldt served as kind of this outpost, not just for the military, but for the community as well. And um, the surgeon who worked here and whose house this is recreated from, um, he would go and make house calls around Eureka, Arcata, or Union at that time, um, and treat things like grizzly bear wounds. I know I love this desk so much. Things like grizzly bear wounds, um, timber industries, all kinds of stuff. That He was the primary surgeon in the area. So the community was so small that... Um, they needed the doctor from the fort to go and make house calls. They also dressed, this is supposed to be the doctor's office, and they added in here a bed because they believed that he may have been so busy that he would have to take patients into his personal home. This is, this is the house that the surgeon lived in. They believed that he may have needed to, he was so busy, um, bring not just soldiers but community members back to his office to treat them. So in a lot of senses, this was kind of a frontier area. The, the world at that time was dangerous, and there were massive redwoods up here, dark woods, old growth forests that these, um, the idea at that time was that these were endless, that there was no end to these forests. And so resource extraction was a huge thing that people did. They'd go through and um, pull out the redwoods, believing, you know, chop them down, 20 houses from one tree, believing that there was no end to this resource. And that it was also improving their safety by clearing out some of the trees because then they'd be able to see, for instance, if there was a bear coming over to their house. And at that time, there were grizzly bears in California. Um, and these places were, were dangerous. You're up here where there's not necessarily a doctor. You could get attacked by grizzly bears, um, other people trying to claim land and things like that. So it was a dangerous time. And... The story of Fort Humboldt is kind of this clash between three different groups. You have the soldiers who came um, to kind of mitigate the existing conflict between the indigenous people and the people coming to settle here. And so the settlers had these 200 years of kind of racism pent up against the indigenous people. But the settlers also didn't trust the military because a lot of the military coming up were from the East Coast and also immigrants from other countries coming in and joining the military. So they didn't feel like the people coming up here really had a knowledge of what needed to be done um, or how to kind of handle this conflict. And for a lot of the settlers, it was kind of their idea that the native, the indigenous communities needed to just be removed. And they didn't trust that the soldiers, um, you know, the soldiers didn't just go out and exterminate. And the um, settlers didn't necessarily trust the soldiers for that and in some cases took matters into their own hands. So it was a rough life up here um, in the 1850s for the settlers as well. And i just like to provide a little bit of context of the things that were going on in the world, what their life may have been like. And while it's really easy for us to talk about how um, some of the actions of the soldiers taken from Fort Humboldt were, or not the soldiers, but, well, the soldiers as well, but the settlers and um, it's easy to look back on historical actions with what we know now and to say something's wrong but I think it's really important when you're thinking about these 
um, historical events to try and put yourself in the mindset of the people who were living during that time that this was a dangerous place, that these settlers felt that they needed to protect themselves, and the best way to do that was to have land to make money and um, to protect themselves. Melanie says, I assume the military sided against the indigenous people. Is that the case? And that is a great question. And the answer is mostly no. Um, it was their job to mitigate conflict, not to side with one or the other. And what the soldiers actually ended up doing for most part is nothing. They ended up building up the fort and kind of providing this as a sanctuary or safe haven um, for people who were involved in conflict. They could come here, be protected from whoever might be trying to attack them, and their wounds could be treated and things like that. So this was supposed to be a safe place, but as you might imagine, for the indigenous people, the soldiers who were serving at the fort saying that they were helpful were not um, different necessarily than the settlers who were coming out and attacking their, their settlements, their tribes, their people. So it was hard. They didn't necessarily trust the soldiers either. How this whole conflict ended up um, resolving was the Civil War. So the, the soldiers who were serving at Fort Humboldt were called, called away to serve in the Civil War, and a militia made up of the, um, the settlers coming out kind of took over military control of Fort Humboldt um, through a militia called the California Volunteers. And there were some atrocious things that happened once the militia was in control, but that is essentially how the story ends, is the militia then had the power of the military, um, the indigenous people were removed from their land. And the, the uh, militia, who was now operating as the military, kind of considered their job done. So really quick, um, I'll do one last walk through here. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and pop them down um, in the comments and I will happily answer them. But I'll do one last little walk through here because I just got a question from Sandra that said, was that the front door? Um, so this house is really interesting because um, the, the kitchen was added on after the fact. So this door that I'm walking to right now, this was the front door. This is where you would enter from. And you have, this is kind of like a living room here. You have the office or study here. Oh, what was that in the front door? Oh, this is the back door. And um, yes, this was something for plowing. They had cow, uh, cows here. Yes, Robin, you're correct. Um, this was a thing for plowing. I had the same question when I first came in here and saw this big metal thing sitting on the floor. Um, but this is actually the back door out to the patio. And I'll, I'll go back outside so we can see that um, to end with. But this is the kitchen. Again, this was added on after the fact. This is one of the things that I think was so very interesting is that they had a maid who came from Ireland, um, the people who lived here. And so once they had the kitchen built on as an add-on, um, they didn't add a door when they built that. And this note right here, um, who was written by the woman who lived here, Harriet Simpson, who was the wife of the surgeon who served for the fort, um, so we have little want for a door because their maid, Bridget, basically lived in the kitchen. She would prepare their meals and just hand them right through the window here so they could just grab them right through. They had an upstairs where there were two bedrooms that's kind of a uh, lavish. They're currently used for storage so we won't go up there and check them out. But here I'll hop out the front door again so you can see kind of how if you did want to enter the kitchen you would have to leave the building, go outside. You could also do this around the back porch. Come out and all the way around to the kitchen door there. That's how you'd have to go into the kitchen from the house. So I'll do one last little walk around. This is the outside of the building. And this is a little bit more extravagant perhaps than some of the houses may have been um, for settlers and things coming in. But just the way it's furnished and things, I think it's very, very typical for that time, that time period. Tuck behind the house because it is a little windy here but i want to thank you guys all so much for joining in today really appreciate you guys tuning into these three o'clock live streams and getting to check out some of our parks um, we're really excited to have you along we really appreciate you guys tuning in for these it means a lot um, to get to share these places with you it's really exciting so thank you guys all so much for tuning in we've got these live streams happening at three o'clock every single day so if you want to hear from a different interpreter or check out a different park tune in tomorrow 
and you'll hear something a little bit different. They're all spectacular. We are so happy to bring these to you. And if you want to go back and check out some of our old ones, you can go onto our YouTube page. Just search North Coast Redwoods on just about any social media you like, and you can find us. We've got them all on our Facebook page as well, but we've got a nice convenient playlist for you on YouTube. So if you want to go back and watch some of our old live streams, we've got them all there in one convenient place for you. Um, thank you guys all so much for tuning in. Again, we really appreciate this. Um, and tune in again very soon, tomorrow, 3 o'clock, for another live stream. Thank you guys so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And stay safe out there. Thank you.